students, they can have a dialogue around the things that they need to do or do more of, do less of, do better of. So the kinds of questions that these tools begin to ask are, and you know, a lot of this has to do with reporting. We all have to do in the technology business and, and uh, as administrators reporting. So it asks the question first to describe the past. What happened? Um, the present, why did it happen? And then the future, what will happen? And finally, the holy grail really is what can we do to improve? If we have an issue with graduation rates, if we have an issue with student retention rates, where can we make the proper interventions to improve student success, to improve graduation rates? And we know that these things take a lot of time and that it takes a great deal of the college working together to make these things happen. But these tools, these analytic tools, can help us uh, go beyond um, our intuition um, and um, our, our dialogue in, in meetings. It can help support us to make informed decisions. And so these used to be separate tools, business intelligence and analytics, and now what we're seeing is that these tools are coming together in the same package. Um, and by the way, the area of business intelligence is probably one of the uh, biggest areas of investment that companies uh, around the world are beginning to make investments in. Uh, they're still struggling with how to use it in some cases. Some are better than others. I mentioned some before places like Google do a great job, Amazon do a great job. And we could actually learn a lot from the online industry and from the retail industry. For example, um, you know, places like The Gap. All of a sudden, they have a run on red sweaters, right? And so they may realize that there are places in the country where red sweaters are not selling out. Um, and so they can begin to ask questions, what's the difference? And where are, are those, where are we, and, and begin to work with suppliers to make sure that red sweaters come in stock more quickly. So these are um, uh, the kinds of things that are being done in retail that are, are things that we can learn from and begin to think about within uh, higher education. So I talked before about the variety of systems that are in place with regard to um, what we look at as, as data. So for example, we use uh, a PeopleSoft system at City University for student information. Um, that has a lot of data, and most of our business intelligence data comes from that. It has information that you'll see soon when Lee does the demonstration. We have our learning management systems. We have to use Blackboard within, um, uh, within City University, and that has, again, a lot of data, and from the distance learning perspective, yes? Uh, you have Blackboard, uh, Blackboard is hosted, uh, where is it hosted? Yes, it's hosted by, by Blackboard in our case. Yeah. Um, so it used to be hosted internally, and then they moved it to being hosted uh, by the vendor. And you, get, and you still get data from it? I mean, from like login information? And... Well, yes, because they have a tool called um, um, Blackboard Analytics uh, that allows you to get that kind of information. Um, faculty members can get a lot of information about students, but without some of the tools that uh, you need it's, uh, to pull the data. Um, it's hard to get information from Blackboard sometimes about everything, so you want to see across your institution. So um, it's very useful information because it helps you, just like attendance helps you. You know, there's a lot of information that says if students attend classes, they tend to do better. Um, different institutions capture attendance data uh, in different ways, some only, uh, for example, in the third week, or, or some capture uh, student information by having their, them swipe their card, or somehow log in on a daily basis for every class that they take. And so, you know, the idea here is how can you take all of these individual pieces of data and bring them together so that you have what can be considered to be a way of thinking about students that says, you know, these are the factors in, in, on our campus that are associated with student success. 
and my, my sense is that it will be different for different colleges um, based, on, uh, based on the nature of the college, the students, and so on. So one size does not fit all. So the idea is to figure out um, what works best for your campus and for your students. And that is where the experimentation comes in and working together in partnership across the campus. Um, we use different communication tools. We use um, email. Um, we, use, uh, uh, that's, uh, we use some text messaging. But for example, um, we now have a tool that allows us to indicate as uh, most, when you get uh, marketing, from different companies to your own personal email, they know if you clicked uh, into that uh, link, right? They know if you, if when you click into that link, if you purchase something. So we're able to tell now um, if a student opened up an email. And it's, it's often said that students don't respond to email. Is that the main way that your campuses communicate with students? Through email? Is it still? Yeah, uh, we use email. We, we also, in our case, we, we are using, we have been using like for a year, an, an automatic uh, caller, a caller. A robot call? Yeah, oh. yeah. And, uh, and, uh, even, we don't have uh, a text messaging yet because uh, I don't, we don't have a system that will allow the student to unsubscribe uh, text messaging. Right, but we're working on it. But basically, email is, is, the, is, the, most, is the most used in our case. Right. We, um, you know, and, and a lot of people say that email is dead. And it certainly will evolve, and it will certainly become more social. But it is the main way that most campuses communicate with students. And, um, you know, in, in the workplace, uh, and many of, uh, of your students, like Lehman's, uh, are working. Um, they tend to be older adults. Uh, they tend, in some cases, to be parents. Uh, but in the workplace, students are using email. So um, we need to um, refine how we communicate with students. So for example, how can we eliminate emails that are less important? On our campus, we tend to send a lot of emails every week. So we're working with our Vice President of Student Affairs to, to curate emails so that they get one email every week that has maybe you know two or three lines and links for more information. So they get, instead of 10 emails a week, they get maybe one with a lot of information and they can decide what information is relevant to them. Um, but we also have a tool now that allows us to understand when do they open email. So perhaps information on financial aid uh, gets open very quickly, uh, or scholarship information, but perhaps information about um, what the cafeteria menu is is not open as quickly. So we can begin to look at that data and associate it with other information. If it's relevant, it may not be relevant. Um, then we have retention systems, which are key to understanding how students um, are, um, are operating and how we can intervene effectively. So for example, uh, one of our uh, inter uh, retention systems is a tool that allows faculty or administrators to be able to send a note to counselors to say, you know, the student uh, is behaving differently in class or all of a sudden their attendance is not good. Or, for example, maybe uh, the student has come to the faculty member to describe a, uh, a, a, an issue with, with academic uh, related work. And so it's a way for the campus to communicate internally, almost like a case management system that some of you may be using uh, or have seen in the human services area that allows students uh, to be uh, counseled at appropriate times so that they can be retained and maybe there's an issue in their lives that with some assistance, uh, can, barriers can be removed. Um, and then finally, student engagement systems. So for example, um, are students involved in campus activities? Are they members of student government? Um, are they in leadership positions? And how do these factors uh, uh, around student engagement, how are they associated with student success or not? So putting these all together 
uh, in one system and looking for patterns and beginning to identify what's meaningful from what's not meaningful is the essence of really of, of business intelligence. And that's, that's where we're trying to, to go. We do not have everything in place in terms of connecting all these dots, but that's where we're moving. So why do we do this? Um, for um, very tangible reasons, right? We want to uh, increase our recruitment of, of students. There's a great deal of competition. There's competition for students that's growing. It used to be that there was competition within a region, but there are no barriers anymore, right? With distance education, students could be in one country or one region and learn from another region. So, um, you know, the idea uh, that my parents might have told me when I was younger, uh, just go to your room, study online for four years and let us know when you're done. That's not really what it's about. But you, you, you really have a benefit by being on campus, by understanding um, the wonderful, rich things that happen in campus life. But all of us are involved in some form of distance learning and that's very necessary for our students especially those that are working uh, and have commitments during the day. They can take courses at night or weekends, so on. Um, revenue growth, right? We all are struggling with regard to this increasing landscape. For those of you that are in public institutions like we are at Lehman, um, there's the likelihood of less and less public funding. So revenue growth and making sure that you have a stable financial uh, status is, is very important. And finally, avoiding costs. What, what can we do to offset costs uh, that are increases? For example, does it make sense to build facilities in this day and age when there's much more online education? Or when you can have your, your campus open um, nights, uh, uh, weekends, and so on. So those are the sorts of things that you can use this data for. And it can, in fact, uh, be a way to make more informed decisions and save uh, save uh, uh, resources for the campus. So now what we want to do is ask you to work in small groups um, and answer a few questions. And so if you could just self-select into groups of, of three or four, maybe we could have a few of you get together and answer some of these questions. First of all, what are your systems of record? What are the most important systems that you use or rely on on campus for information? Even if you're not an IT person, you know what those, and use those systems, number one. Number two, what are you most proud of with regard to your campus about how data is used? If there's something that stands out to you about how you're using data, that's a strength that you can draw upon going forward. And finally, what, do you, um, what have you done on your campus to make data more transparent? What we found is that in, in, um, in, historically, most campuses and many administrators on those campus hold their data to themselves. It's mine, I'm not gonna share it, it's on my computer, you know, I'm gonna guard it and make sure that nobody sees it or has access to it except me. So now we're moving into that world where that data is open and free um, and available um, and that it's something that's to be shared and leveraged with other data. So do you have any of those uh, issues on your campus and that deals with how we as a campus deal with the culture of data. So um, why don't we take uh, about 10 minutes uh, for you to have these discussions, maybe a few, few groups and then we'll ask you to have somebody report out and just mention a few of the highlights from your group discussion, okay? So maybe this side of the room over here and this side of the room over there. Thank you.